and just to set a little bit of context about where we, we find ourselves. Uh, and obviously, and especially over the last six to 12 months, there really seems to have been a ramping up in, in commitments towards net zero. And 2050 is, is the magical target for, for governments, EU, um, the US uh, and other, other nation states have committed to net zero by 2050 in line with COP21 commitments uh, in Paris uh, a couple of years ago. So hopefully they'll be doubled down on in COP26 in, in Glasgow and obviously the recent IPCC report, which uh, spelled uh, spelled out in, in grave terms the implications of uh, not not decarbonizing uh, in, uh, in a lot of detail. But the, the problem with 2050 is obviously it's a little bit away and really 2030 is a critical date to hit, to hit our targets. And that's why the EU have spent a lot of time putting together their Fit for 55 package of measures to hit 55% decarbonization by 2030 compared to a 20, uh, 1990 baseline. And really that means that the decade of the 2020s, uh, obviously we've lost a year or two with the pandemic, but the decade of the 2020s really needs to be the decade of decarbonization and digitization also, because digitization is gonna be a key tool in actually decarbonizing as well as the assets, you know, solar and batteries and all the kind of stuff that we're gonna talk about today. So just further uh, on the context, obviously um, you may have seen yesterday that carbon went uh, above for the first time ever a 60 euros per ton uh, price, uh, and which is really a kind of a massive acceleration or, uh, uh, of, of the carbon price over the last three or four years. Carbon in 2017 was about four euros a ton, and now it's 60 euros a ton. Now, while it may recede or it should recede, it's mainly been driven by very high gas prices, which are forcing a lot of European power gen utilities to burn more coal, which means they have to buy more carbon allowances. Um, and that gas spike should recede or will recede next year, and thus the carbon price with it. To hit 55% decarbonization by 2030, carbon has really got to be at 90 to 100 euros a ton by 2030, which means if we are at about 50 euros a ton now, it's got to appreciate by about six or seven percent for the next eight years or so to, to be on target. And because the market for carbon is a very political market, it's not a you know it's not a physical market for oil or copper or steel or something like that. The EU can actually obviously withdraw allocations or uh, put in more allocations to get to the price that they they want to get to in carbon to force investment in, in decarbonization. So just to talk about what we're going to talk about today a little bit, uh, as you're probably aware, there's three main um, types of carbon emissions, uh, scope one, two, and three. Scope one is direct emissions from combustion generally on site, so gas or oil combustion, but also uh, refrigeration gases, fugitive emissions. Uh, so relatively easy to keep track of and to measure. You look at your gas bill, you see kilowatt hours of gas, you can convert that to carbon relatively easily. Scope two is indirect emissions from electricity. So you buy electricity, some of that electricity comes from wind power, some of it comes from gas fired power plants uh, down the road. So the emissions related to that combustion of gas is scope two. And then scope three, which is kind of thorniest issue. And you know, in a lot of cases, that's where the biggest uh, emissions come from is everything in your supply chain up to your factory gate and then leaving your factory gate downstream. So everything from packaging, logistics, uh, how your employees get to work, uh, how your customers use your product, et cetera, can be counted as scope three. And for today's purposes, we're gonna focus on scope one and two. Uh, uh, and scope three is a, is a whole other discussion and it's quite a thorny issue in terms of accounting for it and, and figuring out what your scope three emissions are and then what to do with them. But it should be said that in fact, a lot of scope three emissions are other people's scope one and two emissions because you know, they have to make plastic and packaging, et cetera, in their factories. So uh, I'm just gonna pass over to Colin uh, just for a change of voice, if nothing else. Uh, and uh, Colin's gonna take you through the next uh, section. Update. Yeah, thanks for that, Alan. Good afternoon, everyone. Great to see so many people attending the, the live. So appreciate it. Everyone is busy and there's a lots on, as they say. So I think one of the themes we want to touch on is net zero. Is it's it's going to be a journey. This is not really a one and done, once and done uh, exercise. If we go on to the next slide, and we found, or and in our experience, it's all driven um, from from a similar cycle that, that that's relevant across the industrial sectors. Uh, pharma is included in that, as are you know many other sectors in, within which we work, and and we find that you know data is a key here. 
that you know generally most pharma sites will have a, a range of data sources as you can see on the left there SCADA systems laboratory information management systems quality assurance and control systems and databases uh, there could be metering systems utilities plants in there air compressors refrigerations chillers boiler plant there's logs associated with these various systems and the engineering maintenance management system and even the purchasing system as well all really valuable useful sources of data and in the ideal you would find a, a central point person or piece of software in terms of a collator that gathers in all that data hopefully seamlessly organizes it makes sure it's clean and correct verified and organized ready to use at your fingertips from there out is driven all the various reports and we all enjoy the good reporting cycles and burdens that they bring within most organizations and out from those reports and that same source data is where you should be able to identify you know problems opportunities areas for improvement what are the plans going forward we, we can we can sort a b c and d here from that you move on to taking the action so as you've identified those problems areas for improvement there's generally two kinds of action you can take the operational changes do a bit of maintenance change some set points adjust a setting maybe clean a heat exchanger take that action let's see did that improve our heat transfer did that improve our output did that improve our yield confirm that effect that you expected and then look to maintain it you know ensure the behavior is embedded with operations or engineering or wherever that behavior needs to be embedded maintain that for the short long uh, short medium and long term some of the other strand of action there is more around sort of capex action you have to go and get funds approved budgeted for uh, and equipment needs to be conceptually designed feed detail design maybe needs to be undertaken and it needs to be implemented as well but if you are looking at say doubling your output uh, by installing a new line you to confirm that effect have you doubled your output and then you need to maintain that short medium long term and so the south the virtuous cycle comes around and completes as we go on to the next slide from where we're going to uh, speak today is you know this is a potential path to, to start down that journey of getting towards net zero that you could follow and you could get reasonably good results in this sort of first pass you know initially you would need to identify and audit the, all your data sources any sensor meeting or instrumentation gaps gather all that data together uh, and, and analyze it and see where your particular opportunities would, would lie. Um, you would then look to design the energy efficiency and the green heat solutions. And as we go further into the, this masterclass, you'll see where we're coming from in terms of these kinds of solutions. And in addition, you would look at solar to sort of size off that reduced consumption load and then move into the implementation phase of the energy efficiency solutions, the solar and the battery energy storage system, and the further the green heat uh, solution that may be relevant for your particular operation. Obviously, there'll be commissioning works, performance verification, commercial maximization that will come onto. There is the potential to generate revenues from these decarbonization technologies that help the overall payback. And then you move back almost round to the start of the cycle. Ongoing monitoring and optimization is key, but go back to the start of the process and look at what's going to be next to further move towards ideally zero and maybe even into negative carbon in the future. We go on to the next slide. I will hand back um, to Alan. No, I won't. I'll be taking this one. Apologies, checking my notes. So the best kilowatt hour we find is the one that you don't actually consume. If you go on to the next slide, please, Alan. This is a, a typical electrical consumption and breakdown uh, across the across a typical pharmaceutical thing. Now, all, all sites are different, don't get me wrong. You know, you have medical devices, you could be generating uh, pills and tablets, or you could be around solutions and powders. So they're all different. They all ultimately will have different consumptions. We're not saying you know, it's a one size fits all, but typically on the electric electricity portfolio, these kinds of systems are in place with your fans, dust collectors, chillers, pumps, process equipment, air compressors, lighting, vacuum pumps, uh, and, and really miscellaneous, you know, small items that are not really captured in the main systems. Should be worth noting around about 50 to 75% is, is HVAC and the systems that serve HVAC in terms of heating and cooling. And from that consumption there, uh, there's a range of measures that we'll just mention in a slide or two's time that you know could be looked at and analysed and potential to bring savings not only on the electricity portfolio but on the thermal portfolio as well 
between five to 35% of your existing consumption. Just depends what investments have been undertaken, how well and optimal the plant is run uh, at present. But typically in our experience, that range is possible. If you had to push us into like, you know, a more certainty, 20 to 25 is, is eminently achievable as long as you know not a brand new plant with absolutely everything brand new and fully optimized from the start. If we move on to the next slide, again, a, a thermal breakdown and the, the figures here are just, again, indicative. Different sites will have different consumptions, but important considerations around what steam is used indirect and direct, and therefore the level of condensate return you're going to get. But then also, what is your temperature profiles? Are you down at the relatively low end domestic hot water, steam humidification, dehumidification, uh, and you know small space heating uses within AHUs and the HVAC system, moving up to higher temperature and uh, process critical requirements in terms of sterilizers and indeed boiler feed water uh, itself. If we go into the next slide, all these should be looked at, you know, from a first principles basis and the distribution system on the thermal side needs to be optimized. Controls optimization can deliver good savings, as can the actual load configuration. And similarly, AHU operation and controls, which touches on thermal and electrical motors optimization and various other measures that could be you could look at again, to reduce the kilowatt hour consumption from the start. The first step on any journey really is to optimize what you're currently consuming. Before then, if we can go into the next slide, looking at what's next, and I'll hand back to Alan properly this time. Great, thank you. So um, obviously uh, solar is uh, quite a mature technology at this point. Um, and uh, a lot of pharmaceutical plants are going this 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 roof, uh, but rooftop solar and 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 uh, out in land out inside of the plant. Uh, but I suppose the question we ask ourselves and ask our customers is, you know, how do you get the most from solar? It tends to be sometimes done just put up on the roof, and hopefully it's producing what it should produce uh, for the sunlight that's falling on it. Uh, and just to set a bit of context around solar, uh, it's been a quite an amazing journey really over the last 10 years or so since really the Chinese decided, decided to get into solar module and cell manufacturing on a, at a massive scale. And basically what's happened over the last 10 years or so uh, is that solar modules themselves, it's not the whole installation. Obviously, you know, a lot of the cost of the solar installation is, you know, any changes that need to be made to a roof or uh, structures, if it's a ground, ground mounted solar or cables, et cetera, electrical installation. Those costs have probably gone up over the past period of time, but the module itself has come down by 90% or so uh, over the last 10 years or so, to such an extent that solar in parts of the world is you know, like the Middle East and Sunbelt in the US could be one to two cents uh, per kilowatt hour. So very, very cheap. In fact, they think it's possibly the cheapest electricity that's ever been produced. In Southern Europe, those prices are kind of three to four cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, and adding a battery, which Colin will talk about, you know, uh, can add a lot of value to the overall installation, uh, as well as uh, generating grid services and grid uh, value from the grid. Uh, so really, it's been a quite of an amazing journey. And um, it really, in terms of overall net zero uh, approach and decarbonization, it's very encouraging for, for what we might be able to do over the next decade or so, uh, you know, even further with deployment. So getting solar on your roof, as an example, uh, if not ground-based, um, is um, and there's a lot of options out there. There's people who can, who can, who can do this to almost to the point of becoming commoditized. Uh, although there is obviously different options with micro inverters and string inverters that you know, add cost, but add value over time. But generally the kind of rules of thumb are, you know, if you've got a thousand meters squared of roof space, you should get about 320 kilowatts of solar peak uh, energy uh, from that. Uh, and in Ireland, the peak hours are generally about 900 hours a year equivalent, whereas in Spain or somewhere like that, it could be 2,000 hours a year. So that's really where the, the, the cheaper electricity comes from, just more sun, sunlight, obviously. For that 320 kilowatt peak, you should get about 30,000 euros a year in electricity savings and about 100 euros tons a year in CO2 equivalent savings. So um, as I said, it's a very mature technology. But really, I suppose uh, what we do with our customers, our work with our customers a lot on is how do we, they max the value out of that, of not just today, but over the long term. So performance monitoring of the solar asset is, is obviously critically important and getting cheap uh, meteorological data, irradiance data into a platform uh, such as our platform, just to do a small bit of uh, sales pitch. Uh, and then with that irradiance data, you can then predict 
the consumption or the performance of those uh, those arrays. So in, in this case here, we've got a dashboard which is showing in green the estimated performance of the solar array versus the actual performance of the solar array. And you've got a confidence interval here as well to tell you how accurate or how confident the, the, the forecast is. And you can see here the model is predicting pretty closely what the actual consumption is. Uh, so that's the model is working quite well there. But obviously, if you get a delta between the model and the actual performance, it may be a case where you, you go up and look at the rooftop. Is there shading happening? Are some of the panels dirty? Is, uh, is there a problem with some of the inverters? And obviously, the inverters are the other big kind of piece of equipment that in these arrays that you know need to be optimized and need to be monitored uh, on an ongoing basis because they can they can provide more losses than than you want in a system like this. So this is just another example of a, of a performance dashboard, which basically gives you the expected revenue versus the actual revenue. Uh, and if there's a gap between the two, well, then obviously you take some action uh, and do whatever needs to be done to, to rectify that situation. So I'm going to hand back to Colin now. He's going to talk about uh, a very, very powerful option to add to a solar array, which is, which is batteries. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Alan. Batteries, in particular, battery energy storage solutions. You know, the batteries been around for quite a while in terms of giving you that you know immediate coverage from, say, a UPS point of view on critical systems, so on and so forth. If we move on to the next slide, please, Alan. Batteries have, and in particular the storage, side, have benefited really. Electric cars, obviously, Elon Musk. Uh, love them or loathe them uh, he's a he's a man in the news but he's helped drive down those costs so, so similar to solar pv there's been an exponential cost reduction over the last 10 years on batteries and, and and storage systems and then you know a battery could be fantastic if you're fortunate of enough to have you know sufficient land adjacent to your site or relatively close there is a potential to install you know an oversized solar PV array and use the battery to store that excess to become, you know, potentially fully self-sufficient of your own generated uh, electricity, which would be a really attractive and, you know, decarbonizing in one fell swoop, at least on the electricity portfolio uh, solution. Now, not all sites are, you know, have that advantage. Uh, and in general, if you have a rooftop install and a suitably sized uh, consumption, you're, you're going to self-consume most of that electricity apart from, say, weekends and things like that. So the battery can provide storage for that excess. But furthermore, in with the adoption of more and more renewable and intermittent renewable technologies onto the grid, particularly on island, but this is happening across the world, um, you know, there's instability brought by that adoption, which is a good thing, of uh, renewable technologies. The batteries here can then enable access to lucrative grid services, which help the district network and transmission operators balance and maintain and operate the grid so that we can all get our cup of tea after the Gaelic football match is finished and we all rush to the kitchen to make a nice brew. In addition, there's a simple commercial play that can be done with batteries in that you uh, trickle charge at times when the electricity is cheap. You know, for instance, the aforementioned wind turbines They'll be blowing at night if there is an excess of generation from renewable sources at night when the base load demand is very low, the electricity can be very cheap and therefore with a suitable uh, intelligence, you can charge the battery at that time and then discharge in say the morning or evening peak or whenever that peak is when there's associated demand charges, et cetera, generally when everyone's up and about and industry is happening. It's a straight commercial play, but I say it happens to just support the overall payback for these kinds of initiatives and this kind of decarbonization solution. Let's be honest, it's not going to be done at any cost. There does have to be a return, even if the more enlightened organizations are taking a slightly longer term view, there still needs to be some element of review. Our recommendation, our knowledge and experience that recommends around about twice the kilowatt peak of the solar install should be the corresponding battery size, but that really needs to be size dependent on uh, site locale processes and, and those particular consumptions on an individual site. If we go to the next slide, just wait a second. The key considerations around the technology, and you know, most self-explanatory here, but you know, optimized for those high power, high power applications, quick cooling and low degradation. You don't want to be changing out a rack of battery banks every two, three years. You want that to have a prolonged life. And the modular rack for there will be maintenance on it required over time for sure. That modular rack design just allows ease of installation, but also ease of maintenance. Performance, you really should be looking to get up to maximum charge or discharge within 20 milliseconds or less. And again, that supports the enablement of those lucrative grid services that we'll come on to later in the presentation. 
and also you know it, it's not a phone call and a signal these things need to be autonomous in terms of charge discharge based on grid signals and commands and again to support the grid as and when it needs it is very lucrative uh, and it will happen in the background without plant users client even being aware and they've consented to it but it happens to say in milliseconds the benefits from that as we've mentioned were around frequency response and grid route service revenues and there's a number of power benefits on site power factor correction power quality optimization uh, supporting the site as i mentioned from that ups and bridging if there is a prolonged grid fault it allows a calm and measured approach to do some load shedding if it appears that that outage is going to last say for longer than an hour it allows the plant to be shut down in a controlled fashion the critical systems maintained uh, and you know if absolutely required it could support a black star uh, as well from you know uh, hopefully that's not too common occurrence if we go into the next slide there please on mm. this is just some actual real life system results after a battery energy storage system has been installed so previously this site from their historical data and analysis had a range of you know voltage issues you know, that could be anything from the lights just flickering and Oh, what was that to you know causing some issues on plant and equipment with low voltage and even brownouts and potentially the dreaded blackout now once the battery energy storage system goes in it won't eliminate these things it does not pertain or claim or undertake to do that but what it will do and what the results here show is that you know for over 50 percent of the high risk cases those that are in red on the scatter it moved them above the sort of safety line the blue line that you can see on the graphs there and in addition in the low and medium risk cases it provided a much greater uh, safety margin. As you can see, a number of actually very close to the line. So, you know, fingers crossed, you might not have actually been impacted with those as well. So there's a lot of fringe non-fiscal, as in non-fiscal immediate benefits that actually turn into fiscal benefits from this kind of decarbonization technology. I'll hand back over now to Alan. So, uh, yeah, so the other technology we're going to talk about today is uh, heat pumps. Uh, so obviously most people would have heard of heat pumps. They've been around for a while. They're effectively just chillers or refrigeration plants running in reverse, uh, but powered by green power from the grid. Uh, obviously, they're very useful, valuable decarbonization uh, assets for providing green thermal energy to the site, whether it's uh, hot water or potentially also green steam as well, which is kind of somewhat the, the kind of holy grail for, for decarbonization uh, scope on emissions. So just in terms of uh, the projected uh, build out of heat pumps, and this is in the UK. So the UK, even after Brexit, they've, they've really stayed in line or maybe even a bit further with the kind of EU commitments for decarbonization. They have their own EU uh, carbon trading scheme now as well out of the EU ETS. But this is their projected build out for heat pumps over the next 15 years or so, and you can see, in a couple of years time they get up to really huge levels that a whole industry of installation uh, and optimization needs to be built around so up to a million heat pumps a year now obviously the vast majority of those heat pumps are going to be domestic and, and commercial buildings but a lot of them are going to be in industrial facilities which is obviously the, the main topic of conversation today so some of the considerations when you're looking to install a heat pump uh, and there's more than this but these are kind of the main ones so you know and a, a really critical first one is well where do I get waste heat from to what we call prime the heat pump, which is to take some waste heat source or ambient even, and then pump that to a higher, more useful temperature level, a better quality of heat. So some of the sources for, for waste heat are potentially uh, effluent from your site. Uh, obviously that's generally tends to be uh, you know, 20, 30 degrees, depending on washdown and CLP, et cetera. Uh, AHU extracts, vacuum pump ex exhausts, uh, and also ambient air as well. So obviously in the summertime, hopefully, uh, the ambient's up to 15 or 20 degrees. That can be used to prime a heat pump as well. The second consideration is, is the gap between the gas price and the electricity price. So obviously you've got to put electricity into the heat pump to run it. That costs money uh, and it's displacing gas or oil, preferably oil because oil and LPG are more, more expensive than gas, although gas is very expensive at the moment. So what's the gap between those two things? And is it, uh, does it, does it pay to put in a heat pump? Uh, obviously, ideally you want a COP or an efficiency to be as high as possible. They range from two to six, depending on the configuration of the heat pump and the gap between the, the, uh, the two temperature levels. Uh, so that consideration is, is key to, to getting a payback uh, as well as getting the decarbonization by running the heat pump on green electricity. 
And then thirdly, can I actually use the heat pump to access grid service revenues? So Colin will talk about this later, but DSU, DS3 revenues, if you can turn off your heat pump at very short notice and then use your boiler, existing steam or gas fired boiler to make up your steam supply or your LPHW supply, well then that could be become an asset that can generate grid services revenues. And then second, finally, is can I use the heat pump to generate high temperature thermal requirements, so steam effectively. And this is a configuration we're working on with uh, a number of customers. We haven't put in all the detail because some of it is IP protected, but it's a three-stage heat pump uh, and each stage is a different, uh, different technology and a different refrigeration gas. So the first stage lifts the heat from circa 30 to 65 degrees. The second stage from 65 to 105 water uh, or atmospheric steam in a kind of a reboiler arrangement. And then the third stage is uh, pumping that atmospheric steam up to two or three bar steam to, to do something useful with it. Obviously, a lot of sites will have existing steam infrastructure in place, and it's very expensive to rip all of that out and replace it with hot water. Uh, so you can then use green steam because the heat pump is powered by green electricity. And at the intermediate stages, you can draw off heat from the first stage after the first stage and after the second stage to do those intermediate temperatures of you know, some HVAC, some AHU requirements, domestic hot water, obviously at this point here, and then potentially boiler feed water if you do have remaining uh, steam boiler uh, requirements or gas fired steam boiler, and then LPHW for HVAC here as well at the kind of 80 degree level. So that's the kind of configuration that can obviously get a big impact on your on your scope one emissions on site, you know, wipe out maybe 70 to 90 percent potentially of your of your gas consumption or oil consumption on the site uh, and decarbonize significantly. Uh, and we should say that you know the technologies that are able to do this, none of them, while putting these these blocks together in this way is is somewhat innovative. Uh, you know the the actual elements in the blocks are all tried and tested technologies, compressors, etc. Uh, just put together in a, in a slightly innovative way to deliver that decarbonization and green steam and green heat to the site. So on the topic of grid services, uh, obviously uh, there is grid services available, DSU, DS3, and Colin's going to take you through what they are and uh, how much value they can uh, they can deliver. Thanks, Alan. So as we look uh, onto the next slide, just an overview of the, the Irish market in particular, you know, as, as mentioned, you know, potentially world leading in terms of that drive towards increasing the percentage of electricity that's generated from uh, renewables. And I think the figure for uh, the all island market as well, so it's incorporating the north and the south. Uh, during 2020, it was around 42% of all demand was met by renewables, which is a fantastic effort. I think the, the, the target is sitting somewhere in the region of 70% by, by 2030. Uh, now, given the build-out of offshore wind, the, the current moves, yeah, there's a, every chance that that target is going to be achieved far earlier. From our discussions with the regulator and the grid network operators, they're talking that you know, next year there will be periods of time when above 75% of the generation on the grid will be from renewable sources. You know, so that you know, previously our models only went up to occasional above 70%, but next year they're saying, you know, we will be above 75 and their engineers are looking at how they can get up to 80 the following year. So potentially that target is going to be met a lot earlier. And one of the whole reasons we are talking about the electrification of heat is that if you do electrify your heat sources and, and, and consumption, that as the grid decarbonizes, you get that decarbonization benefit having switched from thermal generation from fossil fuels to thermal generation from green power, green steam. And you meet that you, you get that additional decarbonization benefit from just making that switch and, and going along for the ride, as they might say. If we move on to the next slide, uh, without getting into the minutia, because this is complex. Uh, however, in essence, one of the there's two key markets that uh, these technologies can avail themselves of. The first one is DSU. It's also known as a capacity market. Uh, and to put it straightforward, if you can provide 100 kilowatts, 300, 500, 1 megawatt of capacity. Now, this may be a diesel generator. This may be turning off a heat pump. This may be a battery and a heat pump and a diesel generator. Whatever that is, the one megawatt you have to make available. And if you make that available for either two hours or six hours when called upon, you can collect between 26 and 40,000 euros per annum per megawatt. If you make it available, even if it's not called upon, you will get that money. Uh, when it's called upon, it needs to be provided. And that's the key to ensuring you maximize those revenues. The next main market is called DS3 
also known as uh, ancillary services. Now, this is really particularly relevant in, in Ireland. Uh, solar is intermittent to a degree, but there's a, a higher level of predictability around it compared to, say, wind, which is truly intermittent. We've all been out walking a dog in what feels like a howling gale, and within 60 seconds, that, that wind has dropped to next to nothing. So you imagine you're operating the grid, and you have 50% of your generation coming from wind, and that happens uh, in, a, in a big wind farm dense area. Uh, you've got some problems, and you need support to stop that grid becoming unstable and untenable very, very quickly, and we're talking milliseconds. This is where the previous technology we're talking around, particularly batteries, can come into play. Basically, there's tiered responses here, and each generates a revenue payment for them. And again, we can show there per megawatt, if you can provide that fastest and frequency response, potential to generate 50,000 euros per annum. There's other tiers available there, and you can add them all up. Uh, and basically, within that first hour, it's very lucrative. The longer ones, one hour plus, you can see they don't generate very much once you get to eight hours, because that's if you're eight hours, you're a power station that's just started up when there's major problems. And hours two to three is generally diesel generators, not from our experience generally recommended. That zero to one hour, that's where the good money is to be made. And if you've adopted heat pumps, you've adopted uh, a battery technology, and you have other areas of your plant, potentially diesel generators that can be incorporated in here as well. For, that's, that was providing backup for previous critical systems. That can all be added into the mix and contracted into these services. So potential to generate very lucrative revenues uh, with minimal impact to the process. If we move on to the next slide, I'm going to hand back to Alan here. We need to pull all of this together. As we say, it's very complex. And let's discuss that in the final section. Okay, thanks. Uh, you'd be glad to hear we're in the final final stretch. Uh, so putting all this together, so the energy efficiency, the sound of the battery, grid services, heat pumps, etc. Uh, how can these uh, solutions deliver a step change in decarbonization? Um, so uh, this is a, an example of a model we, we work on. We're, we're working on with a couple of customers at the moment. So it's using all that stuff uh, that we've been talking about, and actually a little bit more um, using potential future uh, vehicle to grid charging. So um, our kind of opinion is the electric car thing is is kind of done. Uh, as you see, like in Dublin anyway, every second car on the road seems to be a Volkswagen ID3 or ID4 these days. Uh, so over the next couple of years, obviously electric cars are going to become a lot more, uh, a lot cheaper, uh, a lot more uh, uh, common uh, on our roads, and obviously you know employees going to businesses are, are going to be chargers in, in work. That car then can become an asset going forward. You know, it's a battery on wheels, effectively the same as this battery here, uh, except it has wheels on it. So while the car is plugged in, those cars can be used for grid services, for voltage support, and for frequency support. So combining the cars, vehicle to grid, plus battery that we talked about, plus the solar, plus energy efficiency, plus some other demand response stuff like maybe the heat pumps or some electrode boilers can be a very powerful solution to wrap everything up together. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a model we're working on with a, a number of customers at the moment. And then wrapping that commercially, uh, what that may look like. Uh, and uh, for those of you who aren't aware, we have a, a shareholder called TKO in our business who are a very big French energy transition fund a lot of uh, billions of euros of assets under massive management and are very eager to uh, to to fund the uh, the decarbonization journey of, of, of industry um so pulling all that together we've got the battery storage we've got uh, the heat pump uh, and potentially electrode boiler gas backup the energy efficiency measures we talked about the rooftop solar our ground based mounted solar plus the vehicle to grid uh, all going into the a typical plant uh, grid services revenue is being collected because you can use the cars for grid services, you can use the heat pump, uh, you can use the battery to access grid services and, and grid, grid service revenues, and then wrapped up in a financial model, which is basically a decarbonization service. Uh, TKI provide the funding, uh, Crowley Carbon provide the technology and the, uh, and the services to wrap all this up together. And then back to the decarbonization and digitization team, obviously all that has to be wrapped with what we call a kind of a glue layer, a digitization glue layer to make sure you know, the cars are, are being maximized and they're not being empty when people come out at five o'clock to drive home. The battery is full or relatively full. The battery is the arbitrage uh, opportunities are being maximized. The heat pump is doing what it should do, displacing as much gas as possible and thus carbon. The energy efficiency measures are, are, are doing what they should do over extended periods of time and the same on the solar. 
So a digitization layer that wraps all of that up together and makes sure that you get the benefit financially and from a carbon perspective in, in this investment and in, in this decarbonization solution. So I think that's, you'd be glad to know all we have uh, in terms of slides and obviously happy to take any questions that uh, anybody has. Uh, there are a couple of questions there, uh, Alan. Um, I'm gonna put the first one to you. You said you were gonna answer to, we buy green power. Um, is this still worth doing? Uh, well, I would say it definitely is worth doing. Um, I would say, uh, obviously, it's been a bit of a no-brainer over the past couple of years uh, with that build-out of wind on the Irish grid and solar and other grids. Um, you know, to buy green power uh, has been a relatively painless, you're actually not that paying that much more for it than, than gas-fired power. Um, so it's been a relatively painless solution to, to greening um, factory scope to emissions. Uh, that said, um, with solar coming down in price and being a very cost-effective solution these days, what we would suggest is that, you know, factories or facilities that can do solar, they have the roof space in the roof area, should do that and displace some of that green power back onto the grid and leave it available to people who maybe don't have the, the facility to do solar, for example, like a, you know, a spar shop doesn't have a roof area probably. So uh, to make that green power available to other people who can't abate emissions as easily as maybe a, as, as a factory could. So it, it definitely, very definitely is, um, uh, you know, corporate PPAs from wind farms have been a a very valuable um, financial instrument to, to finance and fund wind farms over the past five or six years. Uh, so uh, industry has played a big part in, in doing that, providing that, that floor level of, of, uh, of power uh, price to, uh, to those wind farms. And Colin, you were talking about this and these questions come in, I think it might be for you, is my plant at risk of being turned off because of the grid service? And then how certain are the revenues from grid service? Yeah, in, in terms of uh, your plant being at risk of turned off, you know, the answer is no. It can be made available by the, you know, the client. Ultimately, you know, any grid services can be made unavailable. Now, okay, that, you have to accept that there's a fiscal impl implication of that, you know, in terms of not meeting the availability requirement. However, you, you have full control of that. Your, your plant is not going to be at risk of getting turned off. Uh, by the grid services, but there is a revenue impact on that. In, in terms of the certainty, you know, at the moment, the, the markets have, you know, certainty for the next sort of out, outreach to three, four years. There will then be a review of, of those rates going forward. But as if we touch back on and all the indication we have from our chats, the regulators, north and south, and the, and the operators is as more wind comes on, as more renewables come on, as everyone starts to move towards decarbonizing, the grid is going to need more of these support services and more capacity to bridge you know the ever increasing challenges of more intermittent generation coming on so the answer is you know no one has a crystal ball and no one can say with absolute certainty but all indications are that these technical markets because they are technical requirement to ensure the lights stay on for everyone they are here to stay for the foreseeable future and they are lucrative and another but grids um how can you get grid blackout warnings? Anybody have an answer on that? Uh, well, just to say, uh, so the, the two products that Colin talked about, the DSU and the DS3, the DS3 is very short notice as in milliseconds. So it's an automatic thing. You don't, you don't get a phone call. So basically the battery would kick in based on, it is a relay effectively that looks at the frequency on the grid as it drops below a certain level. The battery then injects power into the site and then out onto the grid, so it's all automatic. Uh, the DSU is uh, is a longer horizon, um, so typically it's about two hours or an hour uh, kind of warning you would get, and that's you know kind of basically the system operator saying, okay, you know I'm going to need some power. This uh, gas-fired power plant is just you know shut down, uh, so I'm going to need power at five o'clock, for for example. So I'm going to need some grid services or DSU services at that point in time. So normally you'd get kind of one hour, two hour warning. Uh, to do whatever it is that you're you're doing to uh, to partake in the DSU scheme, so that might be uh, running a diesel generator, uh, which is the case in, uh, up to now. Uh, obviously, there's a there's pressure to to shift the fuel from diesel generators from diesel to uh, to, to vegetable oil, effectively, or biodiesel, um, or it could be turning off parts of the plant, which obviously isn't typically a solution for farmer plants, just with all the critical activities that are going on. But some businesses can do that, like cement plants and uh, feed mills, etc. Then very briefly, because uh, I'm 
notice that we're at uh, 1550. Uh, two quick ones. Um, why would I not just install an electric boiler for all my current steam demand? And then have you any experience on electric steam boilers as opposed to a three stage heat pump? They seem at first glance a more straightforward option. Gents? Yep, uh, they are. They, they are. Uh, the problem with them is that you're fueling them off electricity, which is at 12 or 14 cents versus gas at three or four cents. So uh, because they're about 99% efficient, I mean, they're, they're more efficient than a gas fired boiler, uh, but the three stage heat pump is 400% efficient. So um, the fuel cost effectively, or the steam cost ultimately is, uh, is on a par with, with gas uh, because there's that four to one ratio or three to one ratio with gas and electricity, but they are a simpler solution. Uh, but that said, you know, if you have a fuel bill for your gas boiler currently at 1 million, if you replace that with an electric boiler tomorrow, you have a 4 million bill, which uh, obviously most people aren't willing to pay. Yeah, and just to say, though, the electric boiler could play a part in a particular site's configuration, and it could be coupled with, say, just a one stage of heat pump plus the electric boiler, and actually that is an optimal commercial and technical and decarbonisation solution. So it would be very, very site specific in terms of what's the ideal configuration or trans transition for my particular consumptions, my particular temperature and pressure requirements. Jens, can you see that last question that's just come in? Uh, how efficient a solution is a heat pump for high pressure, high energy steam requirements, example, greater than 10 bar. The illustrated example was two, three bar. I think you may have answered it, have you? Yeah, so that that's coming. It, it, it's right. If you have a steam requirement, now, th this is where a, a good bit of analysis needs to be undertaken. A lot of people may have 10 bar steam, but they actually then step it down to two bar and the use is, is down at that lower level. That would need to be established. But if there's an absolute requirement for eight bar and certain levels of temperature, yeah, you're, you're not going to heat pump concentrate that up. That's where the electric boiler would come in uh, and that would take that portion of the steam demand, for example, as part of a holistic uh, solution. You know, if you had 95% of your steam demand at equivalent of 60 degree water and just one five percent of it up at that very high level, the solution there intuitively would be a one-stage heat pump and then do that 5% with an electric steam boiler and overall commercially you would get a return, you would get your decarbonisation uh, benefits. Uh, just as an example, but again, it's, it's specific on site uses and technical requirements of, of the steam properties. Great, thank you very much, Dervla. Um, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. It was great having you. Um, no, you. My pleasure. Great, thank you, gentlemen. Thank, thank you very me. much. Um, and thank you to everybody for joining us. Uh, recording I will send out to everybody. It will be available. Great stuff. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy Thanks the rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.